I like that. Hadn't got a sob story. I got a song. Right? <laughs> if you got your Bible open to Matthew, the 19th chapter. Matthew chapter 19. We believe in God together. Right? And you're not just going to hear from me. We're going to hear from him. Right? You believe he could speak through me? You believe he could speak to you apart from anything that anybody was saying? Yeah, we're hearing from him tonight. And we're hearing from him in these days. In Matthew the 19th chapter and the 6th verse. Well, let me read verse 5. Well, how about verse 4? Jesus answered and said, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? There is a difference. <laughs> he made us different because he wanted us different. Right? For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. Verse 6. Wherefore they are no more twain or two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Who said this? Jesus, the head of the church. Should it be taken seriously? Very seriously. Said out loud, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. We don't talk exactly that way nowadays. Let me read some other translations. The NIV says, what God has joined together, let, not man sep let man not separate. What God has joined, nobody should separate. The New Living says, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Let no one split apart. What God has joined together. Who do you think would be interested in splitting things apart? The devil absolutely hates marriages and families. He hates it. He's a killer. He's a thief. He's a destroyer. And his tactics have been all too successful in destroying marriages and families and ministries and churches, the statistics are appalling. How many marriages where people are joined together and yet sometimes in a very short amount of time, they're split apart. Now this is a tactic of the enemy. Go, go with me over to Mark, the third chapter. Let me remind you of what Jesus told us about how how this works and how it happens in Mark 3 and 24. Jesus said, if a kingdom be divided against itself, what happens? That kingdom cannot stand. Verse 25, if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Should we take this seriously? We can't be divided if we want to continue. If we're going to make it, if we're going to last, if we're, got to, if we're going to endure, we can't be split apart and divided. Anything divided, its days are numbered, according to Jesus. Listen to the Amplified of this. Verse 25 in the Amplified, if, if a house is divided, split into factions and rebelling against itself... Did you hear that term, against itself? Who's against the house? The house. Who's hurting the house? The house is hurting itself. If a house is divided, split into factions and rebelling against itself, that house will not be able 
to last. The Living Bible says, a home filled with strife and division destroys itself. I have a very real sense that the devil has been mocking us. Mocking us. That so many have been so foolish as to destroy their own house. People say, well, you know, the devil did this and the devil did that and the devil made this and the devil forced that and the devil... Do the devil can do nothing to a child of God unless we allow him. Are y'all with me, friends? What the scriptures say? Neither give place to the devil. What does that mean? If he has place, somebody gave it to him. Whether it's you or me or or both of us, it's still when we see the devil has place. You can fuss and cuss the devil if you want to, but you're the one let him in. Somebody let him in. I've counseled numerous times with husbands and wives, and uh, over and over again, even though they're not saying it, they're wanting you to pick their side. <laughs> They've been having problems. That's why you wouldn't be seeing them, you know. And, and uh, they're trying to tell, this was trying to tell their side, and that was trying to tell their side. Like one fellow said, you got his side and her side and the right side. <laughs> and, uh, the, here's the, the deception that they're not realizing they're on the same side. Yes. The enemy has convinced them that he's your enemy, she's your enemy. And it's a trick. I said it's a trick. Because God has joined us together. That makes us on the same team. That makes us on the same side. You know with me or not, friends? Don't let this be too simple for you. Who is the accuser of the brethren? The devil is a lion. Sorry, dirty dog. <laughs> and much worse than that. He'll lie to you about me and lie to me about you. He goes to one side and says this, goes to the other side, and he is the original lying, deceiving, misinformation, propagating, slandering, right? He'll slander you to me and slander me to you. And tell me, well, they said this about you, and maybe you didn't, but then you'll turn around and say, well, they said this about you. And, and if you believe even part of it, it can begin to escalate. And then if you believe it, then you're looking for any indication that it might be so. And any little old misdeed, ah, well, see there. They didn't even come over here and say hi to you. See, they probably did say that. Lies on the left. Lies on the right, lies in the middle. Come on, are you listening to me? Until he can convince you that you're on this side and I'm on this side and you're my problem and I'm your problem. It is a lie. We're on the same side. Husbands and wives don't represent two households. They don't represent two different tribes. Two different nations, huh? Two different states. <laughs> Both of you are on the same team. <laughs> if you're able to look at your spouse and go, same team, same team. We're on the same, same team. 
Same team. <laughs> We're not just here to get information logged in our mind tonight. These words are spirit and they're life. They go past your mind. They go into your heart. Go into your spirit. They change your life. They change your house. Change you. Don't let this be too simple for you. Anytime this stuff is starting to get tense and uncomfortable and all this kind of stuff, you need to remind yourself of what? We're on the same team. Why should I be trying to get somebody to take my side? Or their tra- We're on the same side. If we don't think so, it's because we've let the enemy fool us. The devil is the enemy. Not your spouse. The liar, the accuser, the deceiver, he's the enemy. And it's up to us to not believe his lies. And not listen to stuff we ought not be listening to. Not yield to feelings we ought not be yielding to. Not yield to actions we ought not be yielding to. The devil cannot just come into our marriages and homes and destroy us and sever us and and separate us. He can't do it. He has to have some cooperation out of us. If you won't yield to him, And no matter what kind of feelings or thoughts or things he brings to you, you won't speak them out, you won't yield to them, you won't act on them, and your spouse won't yield to them and won't act on them, no matter how strong they are. It'll be like the devil's behind a plate glass and can't get into your marriage, can't get into your family. Say it out loud. Give him no place. Give him no place. No place. Look with me in the book of James, please. The book of James and the uh, third chapter, I believe it is. James 3 and about verse uh, 14. He said, if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. You you can tell the source of something, where it's coming from, by how it affects you, by what it does to you. Bitter envying and strife. Verse 15, this wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. There is a wisdom that is not of God. A reasoning. Uh, Hold your place here and look in Galatians. The fifth chapter. You're going to Galatians 5. While you're doing that, put up for us uh, Psalm 80 and verse 6 in the Amplified. Where are you going? Galatians 5. This is what I was referring to earlier. He said, you make us a strife and scorn to our neighbors. Our enemies laugh among themselves. I believe this has been happening in the spirit realm. Demons have laughed. And mocked us while we yelled at each other and had cold war for a month. Do you know what I'm talking about or not? That we didn't have enough sense, if I could say it like that, to not destroy our own house. (laughs) Fighting each other. Shooting at each other. Not having enough sense to know they're not the enemy. Do we know who the enemy is, church? It's not your spouse. (laughs) Even when you say that, you know, you see some looks across the crowd go, I don't know. (laughs) Sometimes I think he's the devil himself. (laughs) 
He's not. <laughs> I don't know, man. She acts like the devil sometimes. Listen. They're not your enemy. Amen. You're on the same Amen. side, the same team. Right. Hmm? Yes. You need to say it again. Tell your spouse to say, same side. Same, same team. Same <laughs> what we need to do is group together against the outside enemy. Yes. Not let the enemy split us and laugh while we shoot each other. Come on, tell me we're not this dumb. Right? But here we are stabbing each other and the devil is laughing, yucking it up. Pointing, and the other demons are pointing and saying, look at it, look at it. All I had to do was whisper this in his ear and I whispered that in that ear and I had him give her a look and he had her give him a look and looky, boy, they've just been stabbing each other for two weeks now. <laughs> Ain't that the funniest thing you ever saw? <laughs> I don't want the devil playing me. How about you? Playing us. Mocking us. We're on the same side, same team. Now, he talked about in James this de devilish wisdom. In Galatians 5, you'll see some of what this is. Galatians 5, 14, he said, All the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor. Now, neighbor, another word for neighbor is nearby. Nigh means near. Whoever close by. Walk in love with them. Well, your spouse, you're close by a lot. Right? And if you can walk in love at home, you can walk in love anywhere. Right? <laughs> love you nearby as yourself. Verse 15. But if you do what? If you bite... And devour one another. Take heed, watch out, that you be not consumed of the devil. <laughs> no, he's just laughing on the side. While you consume each other and destroy your family and destroy your ministry and destroy the call that God has for you. Somebody said out loud, I will not be a fool. I will not, be a fool. I will not, let, the I will not let the devil deceive me. Fight against myself. Fight against myself. Destroy, my own house. Destroy my own house. He went on to say, if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one another. And then he says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Go back with me to uh, James, please. James chapter 3. Where are we about verse 15 or so? This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. I, I, I left too quick. I'm sorry. Back to Galatians. <laughs> uh, that's the... Yeah, back to Galatians, verse, um, back up to 13. Brethren, you've been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And that's when he immediately goes into not biting and devouring each other and not walking in the flesh. The enemy is able to convince people, too, too often times in the past he has, that their situation was bondage and they had to get free. Are you listening to me, friends? They had to get free from that oppressive husband. They had to get free from that oppressive wife, from that oppressive situation. Look at verse 13 again. What did he say? Don't use liberty 
as an occasion for the flesh. There is a, a devilish wisdom. And so we got lots of people now. They got free. And now they're lonely and unfruitful. Did you hear me, friend? Free to do what? Free for, for an occasion to the flesh. To do what I want, when I want, the way I want, without a spouse interfering with me. Hindering me and bothering me. And what has happened? What God joined together, they separated. And they're free. And lonely. They're free and unfruitful. This is a twisted wisdom. Can you see this? And people quote scriptures, and it's a devilish wisdom. Go back to James 3. There's some things don't need to be free. They need to be crucified. <laughs> if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, lie not against the truth, verse 15. This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish, verse 16. For where envying and strife is, everybody say strife. Strife. Where envying and strife is. Now, envying goes hand in hand with strife, as you can see this. Do you remember the Bible said there was a strife among the disciples, Jesus' disciples? Remember that? And what was that strife over? Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? <laughs> Who's the most important? Who's the most spiritual? Who hears from God the best? Who's the best handler of the money? Who? Who's the greatest? <laughs> Not you. <laughs> Elsewise, why would there be a strife? If somebody said, between the husband and wife, who do you think's the greatest? He said, oh, you are. She said, no, you are. Well, we're in agreement then. <laughs> I think you are. You think I am? Huh? We're on the same team here. You see how quick the door is shut to the devil? Just shut in his face. He tried to get something started. Who's the greatest? Oh, that's easy. They are. Didn't the Bible say, let each esteem other better than themselves? I don't know if that's actually accurate and true. It didn't say take scientific measurements. It said esteem them. Esteem. Count them that way. <laughs> Look at the verse again. Where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Go to 1 Corinthians 3, please. Where envying and strife is, there is what? Confusion. And what else? Every, or you might say every kind of evil work. The Lord spoke this to me years ago concerning the ministry. In a time of praying about the direction of the ministry and what to do concerning staff and these kind of things, he, he spoke to me in a very strong way, uh, in a way that I knew I would be accountable to him later on. And I don't mean I heard a, a vo audible voice, but inside me very distinctly, like he'll speak to any Christian if you listen. He said to me, Keith, strife 
is the manifested presence of the devil. He said, you must be completely intolerant of strife in your house, in your ministry. To allow it is to allow the devil to manifest in your ministry and in your house. Well, if every evil work is going on when strife's happening, well, that is the manifestation of the devil. Have you ever come in to a place where people really been striving with each other and fighting and, and intention? I mean, if they hush when you walk in the room, you can still feel it. You can still tell, well, what are you feeling? It ain't the Holy Spirit. <laughs> what are you feeling? The manifested presence of the devil. I believe strife is a part of the very atmosphere of hell. What's hell like? I believe that's a part of it. It is unending strife and angst and fear and bottomless depression just like heaven is light, life, joy unspeakable and full of glory and peace that passes understanding. We, we must be intolerant of strife Elsewise, we give place to the devil. Now, I know there's folks who grew up in strife. Their parents or their family were brawlers. And people try to um, justify it by saying we're such and such uh, ethnicity or background or nationality or bunk, yeah. junk. I don't care where you came from, where your folks came from. Now you're a child of God. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And what you're supposed to have in the house is not screaming, not yelling, not plate breaking or furniture kicking. Yeah. But the peace of God that passes understanding. People need to be able to walk in your house and go, whoo, this is an oasis of love. <laughs> I could just sit here for all day. So nice. People need to be able to walk on your, on your church grounds. Hmm? Don't think, pastors and ministers, don't think you fussing and fighting with your wife night and day, you fussing and fighting with the staff and this and that, and you come in and the service starts and you come in and start to minister, that that, is, that, that cannot be perceived? It can. It is. You can't just flip a switch and put on a smiley face and everything be okay because such as you have, that's what you're given and it's going to come out when you least want it to. The only way for it not to come out to your kids or to the people you're ministering to, or anybody, the only way is to get it out Amen. of you. Yes. Don't yield to it. Strife. The manifest presence of the devil. Are you against strife? Yes. Do you have to have strife in your house, in your home? No, no we don't. 1 Corinthians 3, are you there? Verse 1, he said, Brethren, I could not speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Babies, little babies. Verse 2, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. You, until you grow up some, there are things you can't take. Spiritual things you can't receive. It's too much for you. Verse 3, for you are yet carnal, and he tells them how he knows they're carnal. How come? For where is there is among you envying, strife, and divisions, are you not carnal? Strife and division is proof positive of carnality. 
These guys were tongue talkers. They had the gifts of the Spirit in operation. This is a Corinthian bunch, you remember. And yet he says, you're a bunch of little babies because you still got all this strife going on. When you grow up in love, the strife begins to wane and subside. Because you just won't participate. You won't participate in yelling matches. You won't participate. Have you ever noticed? Somebody really starts coming down on you. And they're telling you, you did this wrong, that wrong, you're this, you ain't that, and whatever. And as they begin to say that, you begin to think about what's wrong with them. You say, well, hey, you, I ain't that. What about you, you know? I mean, and, and these things begin to just come. You remember things from last year and 10 years ago and 20 years ago. And if you start to tell it, it just come, it just like a flood. It's like you're inspired <laughs> to tell them just how sorry they are and wrong they are and how many times and how many places they've messed up. You can name dates. Because you are inspired, but not by the Holy Spirit. Something else is inspiring you. What, if it's feeding strife like gasoline on a fire, and it gets more and more tormenting and vexing and awful, the devil is in manifestation. His presence is manifested in your living room. And you're the one that let him in. Somebody say no more. No. Say it again, no more. No. We're not going to let the devil play us. We're not going to be fools. We're on the same team. On the same, team. On the same side. Same I'm not going to destroy my own house. My own house. Now, strife is one of the biggest issues. Through strife, if you let it go, it will result in separation. Nobody wants to stay in strife. Nobody wants to live in that kind of envi environment or atmosphere. It won't go too long until somebody say, I'm out of here. And the other person will find I am too. Separation. What has happened now? What God has joined together Man has separated. Go with me to Genesis. And let's get revelation of how to stop strife before it becomes the monstrous thing it can be, the devastating thing it can be. Let's believe God for wisdom. Are you believing with me that we'll, we'll get equipment right now here tonight that Tonight or tomorrow, things come up. The devil try to start the same old junk he has before. We will respond differently than we have before. And we can shut some things off before they break out. I'm talking about stopping strife. In Genesis 13, you see the great patriarch Abraham. And we're going to see the wisdom of God and the faith of God in him in dealing with this strife situation that Bible readers already know what I'm talking about. But there is light in every verse, every word of this. Yes. You got your spirit real open to receive this? Yes. Genesis 13 and verse 1. Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot was with him into the south. Lot was with him. Everybody say Lot was with him. He wasn't just with him only physically, he was with him with him. Verse 2, 
Abram was what? Very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Who made him rich like this? God did. Has he changed? Are you a child of Abraham? Does Abraham's blessing belong to you? <laughs> Somebody say, very rich. Very rich. It's part of my blessing. Verse 3. He went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai. Keep going. To the place of the altar which he had made there at the first and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Keep going. And Lot also which went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents. They weren't Abraham's stuff. It was Lot's stuff. Now Lot was Abraham brother's brother Haran's boy. Abraham's brother Haran, <coughs> Lot was his boy. And his dad Haran had died young. And Abram took Lot in. And when God told Abram to leave and go to a place where he'd show him, he took Lot with him. Now I don't know if Lot realized it or not. But this is the greatest thing that ever happened to him. Right? What God has joined together. Don't let anybody divide and separate. I don't know. I'm sure Lot as a young boy felt devastated when his father Haran died. And particularly in those days. To be without a father, to be without a provider, to, to not have the identity of whose son that you are and the warrior and, and all of these things and the, the head of the house and tribe and the, the possessions, he was without. But God had a plan for Lot. And who, if Lot had, a, had the wisdom of the ancients, and could have selected one individual on the planet for God to join him to and hook him to. Could he have picked anybody better? Mm -mm. Abram, out of all the earth, God's choice, God's covenant partner, God's friend, right? And God in his graciousness took a fatherless boy and joined him to the friend of God and gave him a God connection, a covenant connection that would bless him beyond his wildest thoughts. Is it true? So, Lot has flocks, he has herds, he has tents. Tell me why Lot has flocks and herds and tents. Why? 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 Because he is joined with Abram. And what God has joined together. Anybody with me in here tonight? Don't let anybody sever that. Separate it. Why? Because he knows the end from the beginning. I know so many times people say, well, yeah, but I, you know, I, maybe we never should have been married anyway because, you know, we weren't even trying to serve God and, and we weren't this and we weren't that. Listen, the scripture says God knows people before they are born. Before He, he, he directs their courses and the, the places where they should live and their, and their times and their seasons. Things that you were oblivious to and had no control over. He was involved in joining you to people and me to people. And especially our spouses. The devil's a liar. I said, the devil's a liar. He'll come and tell you, oh man, ain't nobody should be together, have the kind of trouble that you've had. Nobody has the kind of trouble. And you try to look around and the devil will try to convince you, oh, look how happy they are. Look how happy they are. Look how amazing they are. You don't 
don't know how they are. Everybody has had challenges. You got flesh, you got challenges. And if you're together for any length of time, there's been some stuff come up. Don't tell me there hasn't. There has. And it's easy to compare somebody you know to somebody you don't know. I've had people tell me in marriage counseling times. Well, well, you know, he doesn't treat me like so and so. And I said, well, who is that? And, and she did kind of ducked down and he, he looked at me and he said, it's, it's this guy on a soap opera. I said, what? <laughs> it's a movie. Does everybody in here clear it? Movies are not real. <laughs> Let's go over that again real slow. Movies are not real. The guys portraying that amazing couple that love each other perfectly and treat each other perfectly have themselves are on their 29th relationship. And as soon as the director said, cut, they went back to their trailers and talked to their divorce lawyers and everything else. And <laughs> it's not reality. It's not, don't, you gotta watch about it. There's so much of that around and folks have fed on so much of it until they begin to think, well, you know, that's, that's yeah, that's what we should have. They don't have it. They're pretending they have it. Why would you compare something real to something pretend? Selah. <laughs> Think about it. <sighs> Why did Lot have flocks, herds? Why? Help me out. Because he was joined to Abraham. Friends, don't you let's listen to me now, husbands and wives. God joined. There are things you can and will have together that you cannot have apart. They're with me, friends. I didn't say you couldn't make it and God wouldn't bless you in some areas, but you cannot sever the joinings of God without it costing you. Because God intends that there be a supply from the head through that part to you. Mm -hmm. Am I quoting scriptures, friends? Yeah. Hmm? Go with me over to uh, Colossians, the third chapter. Y'all okay? Can you take some more of this or not? Colossians 2 and 19. They'll put it up on the screen for us. Don't lose your place in Genesis. 2.19. Let's look at this in the NIV. It says he's lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. In 1 Corinthians he talks about the head and the body parts. Ephesians he talks about through every joint. Another word for joint is joining. What does a joint do? It joins this to this. A joint. Through every joining, there is a supply of the Spirit. So much of what we get from God comes through other body parts. The body of Christ is compared to the human body. My hand is getting direction from the head. But is, it is not via Wi-Fi. <laughs> it's through hardware. Hmm? Nerves. The wiring of the body. It's coming from the head. But it's going through the neck. It's going through the shoulder, through the upper arm, through the, the joint that joins these two parts, through the forearm, through the joint 
that joins the hand and the, the forearm. If the hand and the forearm separate permanently, the hand is not going to receive things from the head that it's supposed to be receiving. I know so much of what we have in this ministry today in these churches, I've received through Phyllis. The Lord has given so many things to me. I asked him for, and he gave them to me, but he gave them to me through her. Now, if I'm separated from her, there's a supply of the Spirit and the anointing from the head I need, I'm not going to get. Because it never was His will to break off that joining. That would have been my idea or her idea or us together, not His. And just because we had a wild idea doesn't mean He's going to rewrite His plan. It's because we got selfish or we got hurt or we got this or we got that. What God has joined together, don't let anybody separate it. What's the devil's tool to separate? Strife, division. Go back to Genesis. Let's learn how Abraham dealt with this. Lot has not just a herd. What's he got? Herds. -a. He didn't have just a flock. What's he got? Flocks. Huh? He didn't just have a tent. Now, in, in those days, that's your house. He's got multiple houses. He's got tents. Uh. Who does? Lot. Who's Lot? He ain't the father of faith. <laughs> He's not the king of Israel. Who is he? He's not a mighty prophet. He's not a warrior. Who is he? <laughs> He's the man joined to the friend of God. A covenant connection. Somebody say covenant connection. God joined. Oh, friends. Thank God. I'm not suggesting we have to go through anybody for God to hear our prayer. And to the new covenant, there's one God and one mediator between God and men, Jesus. But still, the body of Christ is composed of parts. And things come through the head, from the head, through other body parts to get to body parts. And the devil, it's no wonder... That the New Testament command is what? What? Why? Because if you obey it, it protects all these connections and keeps everything flowing. Genesis 13. He has flocks, he has herds. He has tents. You know, a lot of people divorce over money and stuff. And it's, the very, it's your connection that's part of your prosperity. God will give you a part and he'll give them a part. And maybe that part was good on its own and that part was good on its own. But it only comes to a certain level. When you put the two parts together, now you got tents, uh, flocks, uh. And herds. Uh. Anybody with me in here tonight? And the land, verse 6, was not able to bear them. That they might dwell together, for their substance was so great, so they could not dwell together. This is Malachi 3. Isn't it? They don't have room. Do they? They don't have room for all the goats and the sheep 
and the cows and the camels and the tents. They got so many cows, too many cows. Huh? How many know God is a net breaking, ship sinking? Hmm? Too many fish, too many goat, too many cow, cup running over. Good God. That's his nature. Don't you know exactly how many, God knew exactly how many cows each acre of land could hold and, and, and provide for? And yet he gave them too many cows. Anyhow, that's how he is. <laughs> you remember when he told them to catch the fish and they threw out and, and the nets are breaking and then they put them in the ships and the ships are sinking? Don't you think he knew exactly how many fish to give them without sinking the boats and breaking the nets? But he enjoys it. <laughs> it's part of his nature. He, he won't just, you know, don't you know he knows exactly to the molecule how much you could put in the cup without spilling something over the side? That's right. But he doesn't care. <laughs> he fills it up. It goes over the side. You go, hey, God, God, God. It's where he goes, yeah, I know. And it runs off the table. He goes, God, it's in the floor now. He says, I know, ain't it great? <laughs> he likes it. God, the net's breaking. I got too many fish. He says, not my problem. Your net's too small. God, we're sinking the boats now. Not my problem. You got such little boats. Have some fish. Have more fish. Fish for everybody. Come on, the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. Did it say that those thousands were filled completely and everything worked out exactly right? No, baskets and baskets left over. And so Malachi 3 is a reality to these folks. God, Abraham's putting God first. And Lot's with Abraham. We know Abraham is a tither, don't we? We know he is. And I suppose Lot followed him, living with him in his house and probably practicing the same thing. And Man, they're blessed. They got too much stuff. You can't put it all. And what happened next? At the height of blessing. At the height of prosperity. I mean the Sunday morning crowds were max. The offerings were wonderful. All the bills were paid. Three new cars in the driveway. What happened? What happened next? What happened next? What is the devil's weapon? When people are getting along and the will of God's being done and the prosperity's flowing, what does the devil pull out? Come on, help me out. What does he pull out? Strife. And we, we do well to take it seriously because it has been successful too many times with too many people. There was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. Now this is not just for, between Abram and Lot personally. This is between people that's under them. They're getting into it. Now we were here first. We're going to graze this. Well man, we've been planning to graze that for the last three months. No, -uh, we're here. And it got worse and it got worse. Verse 8, and it got to Abraham that there was strife between the people helping him and the people helping Lot. And what did he say? What's the first thing out of his mouth? We cannot have any strife. Hmm? This is your father in the faith, right? You're a child of Abraham. Should you think this way? I want you to try it out loud. Say it out loud. We cannot have, we cannot have any, strife. any strife. We're not going to have, not gonna have strife. strife. Is he willing to go to great lengths to stop the strife? Mm -hmm. Is he willing to make big sacrifices? Is he willing to pay a big price yep. to stop the strife? Mm -hmm. He is. Should we be? Yes. Should you be? Yes. What's the opposite of that? I'm going to have my way. I don't care what it costs you. 
You're going to have to pay. You're going to have to give. You're going it's what, this is right. This is what I'm supposed to have. This is what I should have. You owe me. That's ungodly. Abraham didn't do that. He's the head of this whole bunch. He's the man that knows God the best. He's the man has got the most faith. How many think that's indisputable? And what does he do? What does he do? He said, no, can't be any strife between me and you or between the people under us. For we be brethren. We're on the same team. We're in the same family. We're the same bunch. We can't have any strife. Verse 9, what did he say? Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself, I pray you from me. If you'll take the left hand, I'll go to the right. If you want the right, I'll go to the left. You just tell me what you want to do. You tell me what you want. And I will get out of your way. Somebody say godly. And also faith. This is faith. See, when you have faith in God, you believe no matter what people do, you're going to come out good. Right? No matter what somebody says or don't say or tries to do or hurt you or tries to take away from you, you just say, well, hey, God's my God. He will take care of me. And it may look bad and it may feel bad in the beginning, but when the dust is cleared, I'll be standing here with everything I need. God is faithful. Yeah, but the water is in such demand, him and the cow. Hey, that ain't, I know where cows come from. I know where land comes from. I know the source. And when you know the source and you have faith in the source, you enter into rest. And you cease striving. I'm not, I'm not going to get a knowledge. They're not going to give me my place. And, and, and I just, I can't be somebody's doormat. And, 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 and they're not acknowledging my gift. And, and see, all of that is fear. Come on, are you listening to me, friend? Fear that I'm going to lose something. I'm not going to have something. I'm not going to get something. They're not going to give me something. None of that fear can be God. Can it? Faith says... If I give and I walk in faith and love, God's going to take care of me. One way or the other. He will meet my needs. He will satisfy my longing soul. He will fill my hungry heart. He knows how. And He will. And you can relax and quit trying to beat it out of somebody or demand it. Or pull it. Or steal it. See what's behind all this? Fear, 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 fear. What does faith look like? What does faith sound like? Right here. Abraham says, look, we cannot have this strife. This has to stop today. You just tell me which way you want to go. You tell me what land you want. You tell me what water holds you want. What do you want, Lot? You tell me. And I will get out of your way. We cannot have this strife. We're on the same team. We're family. We're brethren. Now let's back up a little bit. How come Lot has tents? How come he has herds and flocks? How come he's had a daddy in his life and a family? Because of God's covenant man, because of this God joining to this wonderful man, what's it time to do? It's time to have a cow sale. <laughs> huh? It's time to have a cow sale. Half price if need be. That's what I was going to say next. Give them away. It's time to have a cow giveaway. 
Celebration Sunday. Huh? Free cows for everybody. Huh? Come to church, get a free cow. <laughs> is that what he did? I said, is that what he did? No, what did he do? He made the biggest mistake of his life. That's not an exaggeration. He made the biggest mistake of his life. Verse 10, Lot lifted up his eyes and he beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere. Because in those days, that was before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was, the Bible said it was like the garden of the Lord. It's beautiful. And Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan and he journeyed east. And they what? They what? Separated themselves, the one from the other. Separated. 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 Lot has lost sight of some things. Lot has become blind that all these Herds and all these flocks and all these tents is because of him alone. He's convinced that, you know, he's, he did this. He's a self-made man. He's, he's as savvy as Abram is. He's as anointed as Abram is. He can hear from God good as Abram can. He had to believe some of this or he would not have just unhooked. If he really knew and believed that this covenant connection was a, one of the biggest reasons why he was where he was, he would never have unhooked, never disconnected, never separated. And immediately he begins having troubles. He pitches his tent. Verse uh, 12, Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan and Lot, dwelled in the cities of the plain. Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. And the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. He wasn't in Sodom, but he was looking at it. And what do we know next time we hear about him? They're living there. They have a Sodom address. They're living in Sodom. See, he did not realize how much Abraham's life was influencing him. Hmm? You think if he'd have stayed with Abram, they'd have ever wound up in Sodom? Never. But on his own, he does not have the discernment, nor the stability, nor the commitment to stay out of such places. Did the Bible say two are better than one? Did it say that? The Lord knows that. When he joins us together, husbands and wives, he knows. There'll be a time where your strength will help your spouse to keep from getting in trouble. Then there'll be another time when their strength will help you from getting in trouble. Come on, do you believe this? This is a fact. But separated, you're missing that. And when Lot separated from Abram, it wasn't long. He's living in the most wicked city on the earth. And the Bible said it vexed him every day to live there. He was not just an evil, wicked man, but for whatever reasons, he swayed and moved over there. We know his wife liked it a lot. Because when it came time to leave, what'd she do? She couldn't just run away without looking back. She looked back longingly and was turned into a pillar of salt and never left the place. But as long as he, his wife, his kids, his 
employees, his herds, his flocks, as long as they were with Abram, it was joy, it was peace, it was prosperity. They all were protected. Everybody say what God has joined together. Don't let anybody separate. Next thing you know, kings get together and attack Sodom and they take everybody. They take Lot and they take his kids, they take all his cows, all his herds. How many know the devil is looking to try to steal from you and destroy you and you do not want to give him an open door? But when you unhook from where God had you and you move to Sodom, you might as well paint a bullseye on your forehead because it's open season on you and yours. Not because God don't want to protect you, because you have unhooked from him and you've gotten out from under. You know, I think it's an interesting thing. Lot's very name means covering. He's certainly away from it. And I want you to notice something here. We need to remember it. The very guy he hoodooed <laughs> took the best land, left him with the desert land. Because why? Oh, I don't need him anymore. I got my own flocks. I got my own herds. I got my own tents. I'm my own man. I'm not Abraham's little boy anymore. I'm all grown up, see? <laughs> the very, the very man he wrote off is the man that comes riding to the rescue yes. with 318 of his own guys and whoops, four kings, five kings. It's miraculous. And, and saves Lot, saves his wife, saves his daughters, saves his goats and his sheep and everybody. <laughs> How many think this ought to have been a real wake-up call for Lot? Nothing like this ever happened to him when he was with Abram. You've lost everything. And now by the great mercy of God, and, and do you suppose Lot was there? When he saw the king of Sodom come and humble himself in front of Abraham and ask him for the people back? You suppose Lot was there when Melchizedek came and said and did what he did with Abraham and spoke about the blessing? After all that, you know what's going on next month? Back to Sodom. Back to Sodom. He's vexed with all the vile and evil he sees in the city, but he stays there. He's disconnected from what and who God joined him to. He's disoriented. He ain't hitting on all cylinders. Are y'all with me? You know what I mean by that? He's... And the longer he hangs around Sodom, you know, if you're around something enough, you can't be completely shocked every day. After a while, the stuff that shocked you so much, it's like, oh, yeah, they do that around here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty bad, I know. You kind of get used to it after a while. Until. I said until. The day judgment came upon Sodom. And even then, by the mercy of God, Abraham praying and pleading and said, if there's 10 over there, will you spare the place for 10? I think he was convinced that Lot and his bunch would have been at least 10. I think he was sure of that, but he was wrong. There wasn't 10 righteous in the whole city. And even at that, the angels of God grabbed them by the hand. And told them, don't look back. And at the last minute are getting them out of there. And the last we hear about Lot, 
He has lost all his sheep. He's lost all his herds. He lost everything. He lost his wife. He lost everything. And he's a scared, devastated old man in the mountains. His daughters, incest. And you know what groups came out of that offspring? Moabites and Ammonites. Some of the most wicked, vile people. And then you never hear anything else about Lot ever again. That's why I said the day Abram said, take what you want. And he made the wrong choice was the biggest mistake of his life. Can you see this, friend? The devil's subtle. He's tricky. He's always trying to convince you. There's a devilish wisdom and a devilish logic. Well, I don't have to take this and, and I need to be free and, and I got to be able to do and, and I have this and that. Beware, beware. Is the bottom line of this separating what God has joined together? Because, friend, the plan of God and the supply of God to you and for you through the people he's joined you to is without price precious and valuable. You need them. They need you. Is it true? Yes. God didn't give you everything. He didn't give me everything. We need each other. Yes. Say it out loud. We need each other. We need each other. And it's particularly your spouse and your family and the people he joined immediately to you do not look at those relationships as optional and as disposable. They are precious. They are God-ordained. We don't even know how important they are. Go to Romans, please, the 8th chapter. In closing, I think. What God has joined together, do what? Don't let anybody separate. Why don't you say it again? We're on the same team. We're on the same team. I want you to get ready to shout when you read this. Friend, our, uh, our healing is connected to this. Our prosperity is connected to this. Our usefulness, our fruitfulness, our, our ministries, our churches, it's, it's all connected. And the devil knows. That's why he, you know, it is the most logical in a church. If a church is doing good, the most logical thing for the devil to do is go for the, the, the pastors, the man and the wife. Go for it. Because if you can mess that up, you hinder everything under them. And if they got that in them and it's coming out of them, even if they don't mean to, it'll go through the whole congregation. The devil's a liar. We don't have to yield to him. I said we don't have to yield to him. He's not bigger than God. He's not bigger than the Holy Spirit, the greater one inside of us. We can slam the door in his face. We can say no. I'm not doing that. Now, notice something important. Abraham let Lot do what he wanted to do. Whether it pleased him or not or was his will or not. He didn't follow him to Sodom. Are y'all with me? If Lot had said, well, I want you to come with me to Sodom, he wouldn't have gone. But he let him do what he wanted to do. Love doesn't try to coerce and force. God doesn't make people do things you shouldn't try. No matter how much they ought to do them or how right they might be. Love never fails. Can you see that even in Abraham? Even though Lot disrespected him, did what he did when Lot needed him. 
Abraham was there. Wasn't he? Put his life in his own hand. I mean, when you take 300 guys and attack multiple kings and their armies. But he did. Put himself on the line. Prayed. Interceded. Why? Love doesn't quit. No matter what the other person may do, love doesn't quit. Love keeps believing. Doesn't it? Love keeps believing. And look in Romans 8 where the power is, what the truth is. Romans 8 and 32. Say the word of God is making me strong. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I should have backed up to 31. Verse 31, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, if God be for us, what? Who can be against us? Well, we know the devil is our adversary. That word literally means against us. But who can successfully be against us when we're letting God do what he wants to do in our life? The Bible said when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes, don't you like that word? He makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Not that they necessarily want to be, but he makes them. Why? Because the man or the woman's ways please the Lord. What should we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? You ought to say it out loud. If God be for us. That's too much you and your wife. You and your husband. You and your family. Say it out loud. If God be for us, who can be against us? Who? Who? Keep reading. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Verse 37. Nay, in all these things, you reckon all these things would include all the things and problems you've had in your relationships and your troubles? In all these things, we're, we're not just conquerors. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Not only did we win, but then we go tell everybody for the next 30 years, the devil couldn't do it. He tried. Oh, he tried. And we were dumb enough to yield to him too many times, but... In his best effort and best shot, he wasn't big enough to do it. And we'll tell everybody what a defeated foe he is and how God helped us and he can help them. You do that enough, the devil will woe the day he'll regret the day he ever messed with you. Because you just won't shut up talking about the victory and how you overcome. And That's us. <laughs> Sit out loud in all these things. We are more than conquerors. More than conquerors. More than conquerors. We don't just win. We win and then we make the devil eat it for the next 50 years. Through him that loved us. Keep reading. I am persuaded. You think you ought to be persuaded too? I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, something going on right now, nor things to come, anything that could happen next year or next 10, verse 39. I don't care how tall it is. I don't care how deep it is. I don't care if it's a creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> or the monster from outer space. Or any other creature. 
shall be able to what? Come on, help me say it. Shall be able to what? Be able to separate us. Split us. Disconnect us. From the love of God. Which is in Christ Jesus. And it was some of the greatest love that he ever showed to us. When he joined us to the people in our lives. How many would say without hesitation. The people God has given you and put in your life. I have to be some of the very greatest gifts that he has ever given to you or put in your life. They are precious, sure. You know them. You've been with them, especially your spouse, maybe for years. You know all kind of things about them. But I tell you, if you were dropped in somebody else's house in life for three days when you quit screaming, you'd be glad to get back to your house. I'm telling you. God knows them. He knows you. Come on, are you listening? And when you know all that stuff about somebody and you still want to be with them, we're talking about the amazing grace of God. They know all that stuff about you and still love you and still see good things in you in spite of your little flesh trips. Let's grow up in love. Let's grow up in love. Let's shut the door and quit giving place to the enemy. Quit giving any room for him to mock us while we stab each other. No more. Somebody say no more. No more. No more. No more. What happens if you get to that impasse? And there's that strife and you can't talk and you can't move. Forward. It's time to back off, back off, back off. And say, hey, you, you tell me what you want. You go that way, I'll get out of your way. And it, how many if they got sense, what will they say? Uh-uh. They'll remember a lot. Come on, are you listening to me? And then if we need to, we have a cow sale. Right? What does that mean? I'm, I'm not just talking about literal physical cows now. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the stuff that causes strife to start with. It, I don't care what it is. I don't care how many millions or billions it's worth. It ain't worth severing your God-joined tie. You're so much better off sacrificing that. And saying, well, we'll just get rid of that thing. We'll We'll move. We'll do this. We'll do that. Why? Let's, we're not going to separate. We're not going to sever our tie. I need you. You need me. We need each other. Right? Yeah. There's a supply from the head of the church. I'm not going to get any other way except through you. And there's a supply. You're not going to get any other way except through me. Till we've run our race. Finished our course. Let's not let the devil dupe us and fool us and deceive us. Amen. We're on the same team. Amen. <laughs> and it is the winning team. It is the winning team. It's the more than a conqueror team. It's the team that nothing can separate us from. He mentioned devils. He mentioned the future. He mentioned all kind of creatures. Nothing can separate us from the love of God and everything love has joined us to. Can you say amen? amen. Stand on your feet, everybody. Mm, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. 